Welcome to Smart Talk, where we speak with leading academics and other thoughtful persons on the important challenges facing the world today. My name is Edward Dodson. I am a longtime member of the faculty of the Henry George School. Today, we're talking with economist Peter Doyle. Peter began his career with a small aid agency in Southern Africa, joined the Bank of England for the purpose of learning the nuances of macroeconomic policy, and then spent 20 years at the International Monetary Fund, where he rose to become division chief. He left the fund in June of 2014, critical of its leadership and the IMF's practices. In 2019, he made the insightful observation that, quote, Keynes must be spinning in his grave, seeing the institution he founded, inflicting policies that he excoriated. That said, and as important as that is, what brought him to our attention is a paper he recently authored titled The Price of a Slave. In the United States of the early 19th century, he tells us, purchasing and then selling an enslaved person was a frequent means of raising the cash to become a homeowner, a path to home ownership. Well, Peter, with that introduction, welcome to Smart Talk. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. I'd like to start with a basic question about the evolution of your thinking. You began your career working to improve living conditions for people left behind in so many ways. Would I be correct to say that your current paper on the history of slavery and its economic foundation completes the cycle? Well, that's a very flattering interpretation. Uh, and in a way, it is so. But I think it's worth pointing out that, in fact, the, the or origin of this paper for me is much more uh, straightforward. I mean, literally, and indeed, as I describe in the opening paragraphs of the paper, I was watching a program of Finding Your Roots, which is, you know, a program which introduces celebrities to their to their forebears. An excellent I've program. And, uh, I, you know, millions of people have watched it and probably had the same same response to it. Right. And I was watching a particular one with uh, Michael K. Williams, where he was being introduced to his enslaved forebears. And a couple of things struck me about his and uh, about what he had to say. And uh, the first one is that um, you can confront an economist with virtually any kind of uh, personal tragedy, anything. So think, for example, of you know a mother dying in childbirth. And immediately an economist can bring to his or her mind a full range of economic equipment to think about such a tragedy. So in that case, we immediately have in mind why that happens more in Monrovia than it does in Minneapolis. Right. And we don't have to reach back into some dark corner of, of the literature to think about whatever this tragedy is. And yet here I was confronted by Michael K. Williams' personal experience. And I found myself completely dumbfounded by it. To actually watch somebody introduced to his own forebears to learn exactly what they were priced at, to watch his personal reaction, how painful that was, how challenging that was for him. And for me to realize that as an economist, I was dumbfounded by that. And one more thing about it that, that really got me going. At the heart of that phenomenon of slavery is a set of prices. In economics, we think of ourselves as, you know, the master of prices. We know prices are our thing. And yet here is a, a phenomenon which at the heart of which is a set of prices uh, about which I at least felt completely dumbfounded. And, and I think most economists to whom I presented this material feel similarly. That's what got me going. My, my thought was, how is it that economics is so uh, mute, so ill-equipped to think about this particular phenomenon. That's really what stirred me into, into action here. I suppose that anyone associated with the Henry George School has a great deal of empathy with that perspective coming out of Henry George's work, uh, who examined very much the same sort of dynamics that were going on in societies in the late 19th century. And it seems to me that your observation traces the roots of this um, 
perspective offered by modern economists going back to that origin in terms of, of what economists are, how economists are trained to think, um, the value-free analysis that, that microeconomics uh, in particular attaches to, from your own educational training, your own uh, experience learning economics, did you question what you were being taught in terms of its relevance to the history that you've just described? Not directly in connection to the history I've just described, the, the history of slavery. Uh, but anybody who knows me at all knows that I'm a quite a cantankerous uh, kind of fellow. And this is not a recently acquired characteristic. So I have always been very questioning and very doubtful of explanations given. Um, but uh, so while I never encountered slavery, I have certainly, you know, fought my way through many other issues. And for me, that's not just an attitude. For me, it's a way of learning. You know, I, I sort of learn by by challenging things and, and seeing if I can make up my own mind. And of course, that involves lots of stumbling and lots of disappearing down rabbit holes at, at various points. Um, but uh, no, really, I have to say that I suspect, like many economists whom I presented this material, the first time I ever seriously thought about slavery was when Michael K. Williams sat there in front of me and said, what on earth do you make of this? And I got going from there. And that's, that's really a, uh, a telling statement that you make about your own education and your own evolution in your thinking. Uh, I mean, I suppose I can identify with that a little bit uh, in the sense that uh, when I began my own career, um, I thought that the, the smartest man in the, in the economic world was Milton Friedman. And then only years later discovered how prone Milton Friedman was to making mistakes in his prognosis. Yes. Uh, so economists uh, have their have their certain importance in our society, and policy making is one of the, one of the areas where they have most influence. And your paper developing the the um, economic analysis of what the financial costs were to the people who were enslaved and to their descendants, leading to your discussion of what sort of reparations might be warranted, is really very um, probably challenging to what most people would think of as appropriate, although reparations are certainly uh, an issue that's under consideration today. Let me ask you, from a moral standpoint, the case you make is pretty strong. From an economic policy standpoint, do you think there is opportunity to remedy uh, the the longstanding um, you know, problem that's been occur created for persons of color in our society and other other persons around the world who who have experienced enslavement? Okay, well, uh, let me try and answer that in the in the following way. Because, of course, uh, people will say that, you know, the whole debate about reparations and so on is, so, is such a thicket of issues and such a mess of politics and, you know, so many very different kinds of people in very different powerful positions involved that it's hard to see any way through. That would be a, a perfectly reasonable first take uh, from anybody coming to this from the outside. What, where I'm coming from in this paper really is, again, I, I did not start, as I've explained, by thinking about, well let's write about reparations. I literally started with Michael K. Williams confronting me with the fact that I was dumbfounded about the whole thing. And 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 if anything, the, what I'm trying to do in this paper, as I have, you know, worked through my own thoughts after building on, on what Michael K. Williams got me started with, is to learn what it implies for, for my own profession. So my, my first objective here is not, so to speak, to speak to the broader world. There is certainly an agenda arising out of this, which, you know, should inform, I think, the broader world. And you're, you're touching upon that in this question. But I think there's a prior task for my own profession, which is to get to wrestle with this problem properly. And I think it's important to do so. Not because, you know, it's nice to have a coherent, sensible account within the profession of some dim, distant historical phenomenon, 
but because as I've gone through the thinking, as I argue in the paper, by thinking through that properly, you learn an awful lot about what's going on right now, which has got nothing to do with slavery. You actually learn about, you know, it has quite profound implications for a whole range of things, which I touch on. So the role of women in society, the, the populist explosion, uh, all sorts of other directly, you know, powerfully immediate things, the, 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 the issue of privacy in, in computers, uh, online privacy, all these issues come very much to my own surprise to be informed by actually thinking about the economics of slavery properly, deeply. But my own approach to these things is that before I, so to speak, open my mouth and sort of rush out into the world and start you know, yelling and screaming about whatever in the name of economics, my take on these things is the first thing to do is to take it to my own profession, to let them test it, to let them challenge it, to let them criticize it, to let them strengthen it first, uh, before I sort of rush out into the world to say things. And I've done that. I mean, I've presented this in various places to economists. The paper has been read by now by quite a lot of economists, and I've received quite a lot of of very useful feedback and pointers and criticism, which have definitely strengthened my own thinking. And, you know, what I'm doing with you today, I see as another step in that process. I hope that, you know, through this, another set of economists will come to take a look at this material and, you know, fire some shots back at me to hopefully strengthen it further. But there is no doubt, I am at the end of the day not an academic economist. I'm not particularly interested in being clever or having an, an, a nice article in a journal. Going back to your very starting question, I'm somebody who wants to see, you know, this set of thinking of economics help, actually help the world in some real way. Um, and that would be my ultimate goal. If it does eventually, you know, feed into the debate about reparations that's actually going on in Congress through the HR 40 process and so on, of course, I will be extremely pleased by that. But that is, I have to say, you know, some way down the road. Um, but it is ultimately my aim is to use economics to change the real world, not to not to, you know, color up my own uh, curriculum vitae. Reading through your paper, what really struck me uh, as really insightful was the progression of your analysis brings you to the issue of the balance between human rights and property rights. And it seems to me that particularly in microeconomics, the emphasis has, has shifted very much in the direction of defending property rights without really defining what property is or ought to be under our systems of law. Um, is, that, is that a conclusion you would agree with? Yes, I think so. Um, uh, and I think, at least as I read uh, what happened, uh, other people may take a slightly different view, is that when economists were confronted by slavery, of course, for the most part, they were they found it completely abhorrent um, and, and and awful, and indeed so abhorrent and awful that they basically didn't want anything to do with it, including particularly in in, in defining the, the nature of the profession itself. Um, essentially, therefore, that it became completely kind of almost like a non-issue, something that we we don't talk about. Uh, it's just not there. It's so unthinkable. It's uh, and this I'm particularly speaking about the time after you know, the, the 1833 uh, Act in the United Kingdom, which you know, uh, outlawed slavery on the high seas, and, uh, and then obviously abolition in the United States in, in 1863. After that period, it became sort of this thing you didn't think about at all. And as a result, that's partly why when I much more recently get confronted by Michael K. Williams, I'm confronted by this thing, I'm just completely dumbfounded because the profession has not really wrestled with this core issue. As you say, the distinction between, if you like, human rights and, and property rights. Um, but the issues very much are there. They are fundamentally economic in nature. Uh, property rights is, after all, an economic uh, concept. So any trade-off between it and, and anything else, including human rights, is an economic issue, 
but is one that I think the profession, because it simply wanted to wipe the whole phenomenon out, is just disgusting and terrible and it doesn't bear thinking about. We, I, I mean, I'm quite often confronted by economists who say, what is there to say about slavery except that it should never happen? That's a sort of very common response I get before economists have actually begun reading my paper or listening to any talks. They say, what is there possible to say about it except that it should never happen? And the answer is, no, there's a very great deal to say about it and, and to think about it, including on this trade-off that you are pointing to right now, the trade-off between human and property rights. Over time, it seems that economists by their training have simply moved into into an, a realm of analysis that um, as economists simply supports the conventional wisdom that free markets are the best way to improve the well-being of individuals. But what you're suggesting, I think, is that we need to take a look at the cumulative harm that's been done to people by the experience of slavery, and that this has never been effectively removed from the experience of later generations. And so something has to be done to uh, make it possible to create a more level outcome by some sort of remedial activity or, or steps. Okay, there's quite there's quite a lot to unpack in what you've just said. Um, you know, on the idea that you know economics has become completely or recently, uh, if you like, taken over by sort of rather simplistic free market is good notions. Um, I think that's an impression of, of the of the profession from the outside. Inside the profession, there's absolutely you know, extremely lively debate, you know, enormous literatures written, uh, essentially challenging and exploring that. There's a whole wing of economics called heterodox economics, yes. which basically rejects all of this stuff and explores all sorts of ways in which, if you like, the classical assumptions or the neoclassical assumptions fail. Uh, so, in fact, within the profession itself, there is a very lively, and thank goodness for that, uh, debate, much more lively than I think is given credit outside of the profession. Having said that, when, when I began thinking through, again, this set of issues, one of the things I noted is, is that not only do the neoclassical economists, Smith and Ricardo and, and so on, uh, Marshall, uh, get, in my view, slavery really fundamentally wrong, but so do the heterodox economists. I think they get it wrong, too. Because um, although they <clears throat> talk a lot and folk, the heterodox economists focus a lot on market failures, if you like, the the, the places where markets don't work quite as beautifully and wonderfully as the neoclassicals say, they don't actually look at this particular issue you, you described of property rights and human rights. What, what economists, the, the jargon we would use for that is economic agency. The heterodox economists have also largely, in fact, almost completely swallowed the idea that everybody is an economic agent. These economic agents may not behave in the same way that neoclassicals described. They may face different constraints than the neoclassicals said, but they are all agents. Whereas, you know, as I began thinking through this stuff, I thought, well, you know, hang on, that's not actually true. Agency is not something that everybody has. Agency is a very complicated thing. People have some, some people have more agency than, than other people do. And the classic example of that, of course, is slavers and slave people who have their agency taken away from them completely by the fact of being enslaved. And I say this is this is my view. This is why I see this as a very fundamental issue in the whole construction of economics. But it's one that affects both the neoclassical wing of the of the profession and the heterodox wing of the profession, because both of them, ironically, share this notion that everybody is an agent, despite the very obvious evidence from slavery itself and many other places that it takes with paper, that that, that that is not so. Agency is a very rich and complex uh, idea and, and phenomenon, and economics hasn't wrestled with its complexity, in my view, at all, either the neoclassicals or the 
heterodox wing. As to your point about bringing it forward to, you know, is this just a case of, are there things arising from slavery looked at through this lens which still need to be addressed now, in particular with regard to reparations? Of course, my answer to that is based on the paper. Yes, there certainly are those issues. But one of the things I am sort of struck by, and again, I didn't start out expecting to think this, but I've ended up thinking it, is that this issue of reparations should not be, it's incorrect economics to think of it as an issue for African Americans only. Right. The fact that the agency of a large group of people was denied African Americans through slavery gives rise to, uh, through very you know, standard economic means, to a case for reparations. And here's the key point, one of the key points I want to make. And if we deny that case for reparations, excuse me for a minute while I just... If we deny that case for reparations, then we establish a precedent. And the precedent is that when agency is denied, either through that means or any other, that no compensation shall be paid, no penalty shall be paid. And that itself compromises everybody's agency, yours and mine with our lily white skins and everybody else, because we establish the precedent that when agency is compromised, you do not have a penalty, nobody pays a penalty. In fact, it's even worse than that in the case of slavery, as I point out. Not only are the 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 uh, the uh, um, injured people, the slaves, owned people, not compensated, but in fact the slave owners were compensated for the abolition of slavery. So we actually set a precedent in the other direction, and if you are compensating people for compromising the agency of other people which is what we have done, then lo and behold, we are encouraging the denial of agency. We're encouraging people today to start doing it because, you know what, not only are they not going to be penalized, they're going to be compensated for it. And that is an issue, therefore, certainly for African Americans, but much more widely. It's an issue for absolutely everybody that African Americans are not properly compensated for this injustice. The extension of, of slavery taking away someone's agency, their right of self-determination, also seems to be linked very much to Henry George's analysis of land monopoly and particularly the monopolization of rent, which is unearned to any individual. And this seems to be um, an issue that in terms of our our current policy debates is is largely ignored although i i do recognize in the economic literature there is a great deal of discussion about rent seeking but not a clear discussion about the distinction between the privatization of rent uh the coming from nature and this idea of rent seeking as a reward for passive investment or speculation in, for example, the financial markets. So it seems to be your analysis has a lot of implication for public policy and tax policy in particular uh, that needs to be explored you know, with, with your fellow ec economists to come up with some clear policy recommendations. Do you think that based on your interaction so far with your colleagues in the discipline that that there's a growing recognition that this is necessary? At this stage, I would have to say amongst the wider profession, no, because at this stage, the, you know, the, the paper is not being circulated widely enough to make any such a claim. Most economists would be blissfully unaware of this uh, piece of work uh, so far. So. However, for those who have engaged with it, and that's some you know, very prominent names in the profession, um, I think they find it extremely uh, challenging to see that you know, one of the basic propositions that I'm making is that you know, 
the point of slavery, the reason why such effort was expended by those who established slavery and operated slavery was to extract what we call economic rent, was to seize the economic rent which properly belonged to Africans and their descendants in the New World and take it for ourselves. Um, and it is rent. Now, this is a notion of rent, which is, so to speak, uh, I'm thinking about answering your question here. This notion of economic rent is one where we would, economists would say, it properly belongs to Africans and their descendants in the New World. Whereas the kind of notion of rent that you are talking about is one where the rent itself has a sort of an improper characteristic. So a monopolist is a, is a is seizing economic rent from a bunch of consumers, and that rent properly belongs to the consumers. And a great many individuals spend a lot of effort trying to become monopolists. They rent seek. They are trying to become monopolists in order to capture that rent. And we regard that as a totally pejorative activity and, and, and certainly something we would we do in economics uh, thoroughly condemn and discourage. So most certainly there are profound connections between the sort of discussion of economic rent that I'm engaging with in this paper and its, and its treatment and handling in the institution of slavery and the broader discussion of economic rents in the profession, which has not addressed slavery at all for reasons I described earlier, but has looked at the whole issue of rent and rent seeking in the case of monopolists or financial sector or, or you know, uh, hoodwinking un, un, unwary consumers and all sorts of other things uh, which have this consequence. One of the things that you point out in your paper is that the process began uh, with the Enlightenment. And, yes. and I guess that the, the, the growing uh, emphasis on individuals over, over communities. And what struck me about that was uh, my uh, ex exposure to some ideas from uh, a colleague of of the Henry George community, Fred Harrison, who is a British uh, writer and economist. And he talks about the 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 sense that people have that the that Magna Carta opened the door for democracy. His interpretation was quite different. And he said what, what Magna Carta did was destroy the reciprocal relationships that existed under feudalism and opened the door for the private privatization of land and the conversion of this reciprocal relationship between the feudal lords and the peasants, one where now the peasants were left on their own to make it or not make it. And if you didn't, didn't grow your crops, you weren't able to sell your crops in the market and pay your rents and your taxes, then your land was taken from you and it contributed to this gradual expansion of large private control over land in, and, uh, and natural resources. And it seems to me that that's, that's an integral connection between uh, the enlightenment, enlightenment and the eventual enslavement of people who were in fact left landless and unable to support themselves in any way really Th that's an interesting comparison i've not thought about um the the, the relationship with the magna carta and its effect on property rights including over land and the enlightenment um from what i know of the magna carta i'm not going to exaggerate my my knowledge of all that background um you know, it certainly was a fundamentally a power struggle between the the, the king and the and the, the the main barons of uh, of the of uh, England at the time. I see this as a my interpretation uh, sort of the connection between the Enlightenment and slavery is perhaps a little bit uh, different, but that may be because I don't really understand enough about what you're saying about the Magna Carta. The way that I see it is that prior to the Enlightenment and now speaking at a global level, prior to the Enlightenment, <clears throat> Africa was ad as advanced in all matters as Europe was. In fact, in some ways, in some uh, of the kingdoms of Africa, it was even more advanced uh, than quite a number of the European countries. I mean, the main supply of gold uh, 
and therefore of currency, came from uh, West Africa into Europe. Um, they were quite advanced in mathematics, uh, all sorts of things. Um, uh, so they're quite, a, you know, there was, but broadly speaking, there was a parity of what's called intellectual technology between Europe and Africa. Uh, it wasn't much technology, people didn't know much, life expectancy was very short and, and rather brutal in, in all places. What the things the Enlightenment did, so far as I can see, in this connection, this connection to slavery, is twofold. It greatly increased the production potential of the world. The output, you know, the, if you like, the production possibility of the frontier of the world shot out as a result of the Enlightenment. But it only really did so, first and foremost, in Europe, because that's where the Enlightenment actually happened. So all sorts of innovations of every kind from the, you know, the most mundane through to the beginning of industrialization and so on, which had its origins in enlightenment, had its root there, which meant that economic rents worldwide started to rise. OK, because now land was more useful all over the world because we could now use it more productively, thanks to the shock to the production possibility frontier arising from the enlightenment. So if rents are rising worldwide, you now increase the incentive of those who wish to seize rent to do so, because there's now more to seize, which is part of the incentive. We now have a bigger incentive to slavery now than we did before, because, because uh, rents have gone up worldwide. But the second thing that happened in, as a result of the Enlightenment happening first in Europe is that the ability of Africans to defend their own agency against the Europeans dropped. So that Europeans were now able to overpower Africans, seize them, put them in ships, make them go over somewhere else against their will. As a result of the fact that the enlightenment and the technological shifts that it brought about happened first in Europe. Both of these factors together, I see, I'm arguing, make slavery an integral part of the Enlightenment. It is not a coincidence that they both happened together. It is not a coincidence that for the overwhelming duration of the Enlightenment, starting whenever it was, 1500, we have had slavery, including to date. We haven't had slavery since 1863, but if you take the entire Enlightenment period, most of it, the overwhelming part of it, has included slavery, and particularly enslavement of, of Africans and their New World descendants. I'm arguing that is no accident, because the production possibility frontier shooting out raises rents worldwide, gives an incentive to have slavery, and... The asymmetry that evolved now and the ability of Africans to defend their own agency drops, it, it, their, their, agency, their defenses drop, so they become liable to be seized and taken. And part of the thing I find, just a sort of a personal note, Europeans and European descendants in, the Northern, in, in, in North America universally ascribe good associations to the Enlightenment. Even the, the word Enlightenment itself is to be contrasted, I'm sorry, my phone keeps going off, is to be contrasted with um, unenlightenment, with feudalism, with dark ages, with darkness. And here I'm pointing out something which is not recognized by my own profession or more widely, that, well, I'm sorry about to point out that the Enlightenment was what caused the biggest explosion of slavery in history, much bigger than you saw in the Roman Empire. Or in, you know, people talk about, well, of course, there was slavery in Africa itself, which is, of course, true, on a minuscule scale in comparison with what the Enlightenment produced. And I don't think that it is in any way accidental as a, as a cause from enlightenment to slavery. I also think there's a cause going the other way, obviously, and that, that, that is more well established in the profession. The fact that the enlightenment allowed the seizure of so much rent from Africans and their New World descendants 
itself spurred the Enlightenment. It made London, Bristol, Glasgow, New Orleans, Charleston rich. You know, prior to the prior to the Civil War, the biggest concentration of millionaires in the United States was in Charleston. It was not in New York or you know any of these other places. It was there. And it therefore produced an enormous amount of wealth, which of course largely went back to you know the European hegemons at the time, who used it to invest and so on and so on and construct and build uh, industrialization. So I see I'm arguing that there is a sort of symbiotic cause and effect between the Enlightenment and slavery and back from slavery into the Enlightenment and industrialization. And this, I think, is a phenomenon which certainly the economics profession has just erased from any from any notion of, of economics or of economic history. Another element in this in this trend or, or splurge of of the need for slaves certainly was this this discovery by Europeans or settlement by Europeans of essentially unoccupied lands and the difficulty of enslaving indigenous populations in North America. I mean, it was very difficult to, to subdue and enslave Indian populations because of their, the character of their societies. So because, had, because, of their, because of their ability to defend their own agency. Yes. And they were able to do they it. They acquired European it. weapons. Yeah, yes. Uh, they also had much greater knowledge of the terrain, they had uh, much greater knowledge of, of survival techniques. Uh, they had all sorts of things which made it. And they also had the West to run away to. I mean, they could, they could migrate away from this marauding uh, assault on their societies. All right. So they had all sorts of means of defending their own agency, which uh, they used. And, and thank goodness for that. There's also the, the element of the, the African empires themselves and the wars that, that tribal people conducted against one another. And my reading of that period was that the first stage, Europeans made various serious mistakes in that the African, uh, the powerful African tribes that captured warriors from other tribes and sent them into slavery, those warriors had no experience with work. They had no experience working in the mines or working agriculture. And if, but eventually the lesson was learned that if you want good, productive slaves, you have to capture the right people, the people that are accustomed to, to working for a living on the land or, or in other ways, cultivating the land. So, I mean, it seems like this was a... It was, it was directed by Europeans eventually, but certainly there is a considerable amount of, of blame that can be extended to even the people of Africa or you know other parts of the world where where slavery was was accommodated. Right. Uh, what I would say about that is, you know, a lot of discussion about slavery, and indeed you, your use of the word itself brings it to light, raises issues of blame. Who's to blame for all of this? And, you know, there's plenty of blame to go around. What I'm, but I'm coming at this from an economist. I would say that it's not, if you like, who is to be blamed, but what is to be blamed. The point is that the uh, transatlantic slave trade was done for profit. The phrase you used in an earlier question was when you were talking about, you know, the, these vast tracts of land was the quote, need for a new kind of labor. Well, need is a very strange word in this comedy. In ordinary people, not economists, have a particular notion of the word need. What in fact was going on here was not need for economists, that for, for uh, enslaved people. There was a profit incentive. You could get rich by having enslaved people. This in ordinary language is not a need, it is a seeking of profits. It's a, an attempt to get rich, which is a very different notion altogether. 
But also, I would say, just to, to emphasize, when you look at the kind of numbers, most certainly there was uh, enslavement happening amongst uh, African peoples, amongst themselves, much as there was enslavement happening among Europeans in the Roman Empire. I mean, Europeans enslaved other Europeans in the Roman Empire um, and in many other cases. Uh, what should not get lost is the scale. When, when I discovered, again, by, by pursuing this set of issues, that the best estimates are that the total number of Africans imported by uh, slavers into the New World was 12 million. That's people who came across on the ships only. I, I really nearly fell off my chair that the number was so big, partly because, as I point out in the paper, and as you pointed out, you know, a slave was basically, if you sold a slave, you could buy a house. That's how valuable they were. Well, 12 million slaves is equivalent to 12 million houses, which is half the number of houses in the United Kingdom today. I mean, this is, and, and it's considerably more than the number of houses in the United Kingdom that when, in sla when slavery was actually going on, which was when the United Kingdom was the global hegemon. The scale of this thing is simply mind-boggling. And that is not just, if, and I say the scale, the economic scale, that is 12 million houses were shifted from Africa to the, to the New World. And then, of course, they, they had children. When you factor in the number of descendants of these people in the New World to get, okay, now how, how big is this economic phenomenon? It is absolutely gigantic. I, I literally fell off my chair to realize that such an enormous economic phenomenon could be so completely excised from economics. I mean, we spend an awful lot of time worrying about monopolies and, and housing industries and oil industry and, and all of these things. And we think of these things as sort of quite big things to, to think about. Um, and indeed, they are quite big things to think about. This is on another scale altogether compared to those things. And yet it is a, a topic and a set of issues with direct relevance to how economies work today which is just not there. It's just, you know, the number of economic students worldwide who've devoted more than five minutes to thinking about slavery, I could probably, I don't know, it would be in the hundreds at, at the most. And these are people who've probably, you know, been siphoned off into some little specialist corner of economic history or, you know, something like that. Uh, and yet, you know, much to my own surprise, the, both the industry was absolutely gigantic. It still exists today. It's not like slavery doesn't happen. In fact, again, another astonishing thing I bumped into with all of this is that half the countries of the world do not have slavery as a crime. It's not a criminal offence to own somebody in half the countries of the world. I mean, just wrap your head around that. Even spousal relationships under law in many countries. Uh, and not to mention spousal relationships under law or even just sort of in practice, let alone law. So the, the fact that this phenomenon has just been so, A, is so big and so completely excised from economics is to me an astonishing thing that I realized by following Michael K. Williams' prompting to start thinking about this. It, it is, I wonder if it would be possible to calculate the total redistribution of income from producers to the non-producer slave holders uh, and those who adv were advantaged by slavery and how that would be compounded over the, the, you know, the century. And longer. Yes. Well, in, in fact, I propose a means of doing precisely that in the case of the United States. You said total, so I can't, I can't, I haven't figured out quite how to do this because the numbers aren't quite sturdy enough for South America and so on. 
Is the mathematics available? Yes. <laughs> the, the, I mean, I lay out in this paper a means of establishing what was seized from uh, enslaved people in the United States, including the compounding of that to the present day. And indeed, one of the, one of, again, I hope important points that I make in the paper is that in this specific case, that is possible. And if it is so possible, and it, it's not particularly difficult to do, actually, um, it's not particularly difficult to do. And given that it is relatively easy and straightforward to do, it increases again the, the impetus, I argue, for this wealth to be returned to its proper owners. It's something that we have the ability to do right now through reparations, you know. There are, there are, but I'm specifically speaking of reparations here for slavery only. The, the, the reparations debate in this country goes beyond that. They say, well, what about all these terrible things that happened post-1863? And of course, there's a, a very long list of such things. And they are dreadful. It is much harder in an economic sense to calculate how much is owed for the post-1863 things, for a lot of reasons that I go through in the paper. But for the pre-1863 harm that was done to African Americans, it is actually relatively straightforward to calculate. And one of the, one of the obvious reasons for that, just to mention, is why it's so easy to do, is that because enslaved people were so valuable, I mean, they were worth a house, there was incredibly detailed record keeping by the people owners of the people that they owned. You know exactly who they were. We know exactly what was paid for them. We know exactly how many children they all had. We know exactly how many people were emancipated in 1863. I mean, all of these numbers are there in very great detail. And indeed, you know, as I point out at the beginning of the early in the paper, it's one of the reasons why a television program like Finding Your Roots can produce so much information to individuals like Michael K. Williams about his enslaved forebears. It's because there are actually such detailed, accurate records that were kept about all of this. And that is not so, obviously, for much of the post-1863 harm that was done to African Americans, where all sorts of terrible things were done in the middle of the night with, you know, no tracking or done by administrative order here and there, redlining or, or police arrangements or imprisonments and all these horrible things where the record keeping is much less precise. You can't, it becomes a very general issue. In the case of enslaved people, it's very precise. We can calculate to well within an order of magnitude how much wealth was seized from the enslaved people in the United States? It still seems like an extremely complicated uh, endeavor to try to identify the surviving individuals today and what and how they should be compensated for the history of their families. You know, going back to you know the, the period of slavery as you've described. I I mean, I think about. We, we under social democracy or liberalism or whatever you want to call what we experienced during the 20th century, we've gradually acknowledged that uh, there needs to be some sort of social welfare and, you know, support system for people who've been disadvantaged. And we have social security benefits. We have, we have other kinds of income guarantees. And now the big political issue that seems to be debated is the idea of a basic income guarantee. And we've, you know, Andrew Yang was one of the one of the people who said everyone, sh everyone without restriction should get a thousand dollars a month. And so how, how how do you see us in a political way implementing this in a way that won't bust the budgets? We're already okay. you know, we have a we have huge deficit spending. We have a, a public debt that will by the time this current administration ends, maybe hit $30 trillion. The, the, the financial challenges, unless we have dramatic tax reform, seem to me to be insurmountable. 
Okay, great. Let, let me just concentrate on, you've raised a lot of points there, but let me just concentrate on two of them because they really are, are key. Uh, the first one you raised, which I want to focus on, was how do we identify who should receive this money? And that is a, an absolutely core issue in any uh, debate about reparations for anything, including, say, to Native Americans or to anybody else who's been harmed in, in the past wrongly. How do you identify who should get whatever reparations uh, or you come up with? In the case of slavery uh, in the United States, I'm arguing that, in fact, the answer to that question is really very simple. It is African-Americans. Uh, in 1865, there were something like, uh, of African-Americans uh, uh, in the United States, in 1863, the number is something like 10% at that point were not enslaved. So 90% were. And that 10% largely comprised of people who had earlier received manumissions. So either they or their own forebears had also been slaved. It's very simple. The simple, the, the crudity of this phenomenon, or if you like, its uniformity, makes the answer to the, who should get the money very simple. It is African Americans. And African Americans identify themselves every 10 years in a census. It's the right down. I'm an African American. So, in fact, it's, it's very simple. And if you, from a census, and of course, there are mixed race people. So, what you might do with them, I argue in the paper, is say, well, we've got. DNA testing, we can figure out exactly what proportion of your DNA comes from Africa. So the idea, of, the idea that it's complicated to identify who should receive the reparations for slavery uh, is not so. In fact, I think it's actually very simple to do. It is African-Americans should receive that, those reparations. And it's very easy to identify which African-Americans and how much. You then raise a second question which is the resource compatibility. Can we, can we collectively, the United States, afford to do this? And my answer is absolutely. How do I reach that conclusion? Well, as I mentioned to you, I've done a calculation of exactly how much wealth was stolen from African-Americans as own people and brought that forward, taking compounding through standard means to the present day. And I can calculate how many billions of dollars we're actually talking about an actual number. And to, to, to give you a sense of how feasible it is, the United States could pay the entire amount of that in reparations simply by canceling the Trump tax cuts that were put in place a few years ago and holding that for 20 years. That's the scale that we are talking about. And that number is based on CBO estimates of the uh, costs of the Trump tax cuts. So far from being sort of unimaginably unaffordable, it's actually completely within the realm of something that we thought was such a good idea that we just did it a few years ago. Only the action that we took a few years ago just gave a lot of money to rich people and corporations who didn't need it and weren't going to invest with it. In other words, it's a co complete boon, boondoggle. Whereas this would be reaffirming economic agency universally, a much more profound and important economic gain. And the other scalar I want to give you to this, is it economically affordable? If you look at the increase in federal government debt that was caused by the great financial crisis. So everything in the bailing out the banks, the big rise in deficit, the unemployment of everything. So the rise in the federal government total debt that we thought was a great idea to bail out banks and, and all of that stuff. The amount of money I'm talking about is half of that. So the notion that this is sort of resource completely overwhelming is simply doesn't stand up against recent actions that we've taken almost without a second thought. Sure, you know, Trump gives all this money away to billionaires. Great. You, no one worried about, well, very few people apparently worried about the resource costs of that. And as we see, life goes on. Similarly, we were quite happy to do, spend enormous amounts of money bailing out the banks and the economy 
to fix prior egregious mistakes of economic policy and all, of all kinds. And what I'm saying is that the amount involved would be half of what we were willing to do that. If we're willing to do these other things, I think the argument turns around completely and say, well, why not this? It's completely affordable. We can identify exactly how much should be paid. We can identify exactly who it should be paid to. And we can identify who should pay it. We can do that too. That's part of the economics. So, and let me just make one final point here. It is often said, as you also mentioned, that but don't we have government welfare, which is for you know, unfortunate people, and that's all fine. Well, of course, by and large, we have far too little welfare. That's an obvious point. But more to the point, those schemes are available to people whether or not their ancestors previously were enslaved. There's no connection. So there's a good deal of African Americans who aren't eligible for welfare, who don't get this compensation at all. Okay? There's also a lot of people who get this welfare whose forebears were not enslaved. They're people with lily white skins like you and me. So, in fact, welfare is not reparations. Welfare is welfare. It's a completely different animal. And and by sort of just waving your hands and saying, well, what about welfare? Essentially, it's, a, it's one of many means that people do to say, well, let me just not think about reparations and slavery. Let me just move on to something I'm more comfortable with, which is something that I can understand, if you like, ordinary people doing, non-economists. But what I'm wanting to do is to wake economists up. Wake my, my, my primary audience is my own profession, is to say, guys, this is economically completely incoherent. This particular way of thinking about slavery, reparations, and so on, it will not do for us to think. Other people may, may, may do so, but it's not okay for us to, to do that. And we, sh we should stop. Have you had any invitations to lecture to economic students at universities? Uh, a few. Uh, but the paper, as you can see, is very new. Yes. I'm, I am, you know, uh, I've made a couple of presentations in London for this to the National Institute, for example, uh, and various places elsewhere. I would be very happy to make these presentations to students. But I would say about that, as you yourself noted at the very beginning of our discussion today, the, the paper itself is largely addressed at the profession. I think there are quite a number of, say, the undergraduates who would find this material not only kind of emotionally challenging to deal with, but they'd find it quite intellectually tough to deal with because I'm writing for my peers rather than for students. So I would, I would hope that sort of third-year undergraduates could get quite a lot out of this. Certainly, I would hope that, that uh, people doing masters or PhDs could get a lot out of this. But my real audience for this is you know, economics professors, practicing economists in, out there in the world, is to, is to get th that level of the profession to seriously rethink how we think about economic agency. If you can think of people who would like to hear this, by all means, <coughs> if you're still interested in this material after this conversation, Get them in touch, and I, I will I will go and, and, and present this material. Not, not I need to proselytize, but also I'm quite serious that I have really gained from from feedback and criticisms to, to earlier drafts of this. And I do not presume that the discussion has ended with the paper in its present form. I, you've given me a lot to think about, and I'm I'm not you know, schooled as as thoroughly in the analysis as as uh, a, you know economic uh, professionals would be. I mean, my background in finance uh, and as a as a uh, a housing finance lender, you know, has exposed me to a lot of the challenges of providing affordable housing to the people who need it most, and how our market system does not serve their needs very effectively. 
And so we come up with all sorts of mitigating Band-Aid programs, but nothing that has ever been systemic. And, I, and I, that's what I hear from you is what we need is some real systemic change. And that systemic change requires economists to rethink their theor theoretical basis for looking at uh, the profit motive and how income is distributed and, and what policy changes are really necessary to achieve what might be called a really a just distribution of income and wealth. Certainly, you know, coming from uh, the background of, of, of being on the faculty of the Henry George School, we have very specific ideas about what is required to achieve that. And the basic idea that Henry George had is we need to distinguish between income that is earned and income that is unearned. And, it, and our tax system doesn't do that. And certainly, you know, African Americans themselves in the United States today, um, about, I guess it's 55% of African-American households are homeowners. They do own property. They don't own much. They don't have much in the way of assets, but, they, but about half or more do own a, a residential property, much lower than the 70% or so of, of white households that are property owners. So one of the challenges is how to bring that up. Um, the former chairman of Fannie Mae, where I worked for 20 years, uh, an African-American named Frank Raines, once, once said in an interview in response to the question, what would you see as success from your tenure at Fannie Mae and your career? And he said, if, when I leave, if I left at Fannie Mae and the percentage of minorities that achieved home ownership was the same as the white population and that that the distribution of income, high, medium, and low, was roughly equal across all races, he said, I would, I would feel that that was a great success. From your standpoint, not simply as an economist, but from your, you know, the sentiments you've raised in your paper, does that strike you as a reasonable objective for, for us in terms of our, our public policy goals? Well, let me answer that in various ways, but briefly. One of the things I point out is that if the United States was to pay reparations in the amounts that I have calculated to African-Americans, that African-American net, that median African-American net wealth would come into parity with median white household income. Which that is, is roughly indeed, about $150,000, I think. Exactly. So if, if the fact, I mean, again, I was quite surprised to discover that, but the fact that you do end up with equality there also helps um, reassure me that my calculations of the amount of reparations owed is probably about right. If you, by restoring that amount of wealth to its proper owners amongst African Americans, you it generate median equality of net wealth. That is a, an unexpected confirmation that the calculations are within the right order of magnitude. Now, that's a slightly different thing from the question you're asking, saying is there something one should aim at, and so on. But the fact that the economics leads me to there gives me some assurance that, in fact, this is probably something that we should do. If, for example, I'm mean, just to be ridiculous, my calculations <coughs> imply that median African-American household wealth would be end up 10 times that of the whites, then I would say, well, something is wrong in my calculations here somewhere. But it doesn't. It ends up with equality. And in terms of, again, what I'm hoping to do, I, I, of course, I totally appreciate your questioning here. You're trying to think about the ultimate effect on society out there in the real world. That's really where your question is coming from. And as, as I described earlier, that is, for me, also, at the end of the day, why I think economics is worth doing at all. You know, if it doesn't do that, then, you know, put it in the bin, as, as far as I'm concerned. But that's not, I'm nowhere near that in this discussion uh, so far. So what I would really like to, and again, this goes to your question of universities, for sure, I would like to, to speak more to universities and to get out and about and receive their feedback.
But of course, there's one set of the profession who I would really like to reach and haven't yet managed to do. And that is the economics profession amongst African-Americans. I would dearly love to go to Howard or to Spelman or to, you know, these other places and talk to their economics departments about this stuff. Um, that is not in, in any sense, and again, I want to make very clear, I do not imagine at all that in doing this work and this paper that I am, quote, speaking on behalf of African-Americans. I'm not doing that at all. African-Americans are perfectly able to speak on behalf of themselves and they don't need me for that. What I'm doing is trying to speak to my own profession. So it's not a question of who I'm speaking for, it's a question of who I'm speaking to. And at the moment, the, the, what I want to do is to speak to my own profession. And if I can bring my own profession on board, and if my own profession can strengthen this argument further, then for sure, I would hope that this argument goes out into the wider community, including amongst African-American colonists more broadly, or amongst people involved in the HR40 process. But that is all quite a long way down the road from where, from where I'm at now. Peter, you have taken on an enormous challenge for yourself, uh, a challenge to be applauded for sure. Uh, after a, a very challenging career facing uh, the, the, the issues of global finance and the role of the IMF. Uh, I thank you very much for giving us this time and, and I hope that our audience will appreciate the insights that you've shared with everyone and that, uh, that certainly that, that, that the kind of research that you've done will uh, open some eyes and, and stimulate some of, the, some of the economists that you hope will pay attention to do so in a serious way. But I thank you so much for, for joining me in this conversation of Smart Talk, and I hope we have an opportunity to, to do a second round at some point in the future to talk a little bit more directly about the challenges of the global financial system. That would be great. Uh, I greatly enjoyed the discussion too. And it's always, I have to say, uh, great to be confronted with sharp, skeptical questions. If nothing else, I've been trained to do that. <laughs> right. Thank you, Peter. That's it for this edition of Smart Talk. For more information on this and other episodes, please visit our website, henrygeorgeschool.org. I'm Edward Dodson. And thanks for watching Smart Talk. Yes.